And that is ever since about 1925, there's been this measurement problem in quantum mechanics, what's the role of the observer? Because it does play a role, ah. and that's also made no progress. Mm. It's 90 years, it really has been no progress at all. Where this gets interesting mm -hmm. to my mind, there, would, there could be some profound synthesis, because these are, of course, dealing with the same issue. What's the nature of yeah. consciousness? What's yeah. the nature of the observer? Yeah. And the neuroscientists don't know. The dreamlike nature of research, basically. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. But we have these two disparate fields that then stagnate, in mm -hmm. some ways, making tremendous progress. Yeah. I never want to deprecate. But in some ways, it's simply a factual statement. No progress on understanding the relationship between mind and brain, and no, understand, no progress in understanding what's the role of the observer in so-called collapsing the wave function or not. Mm -hmm. But where it gets interesting, and I'll be very quickly here, is where you take the principles of quantum mechanics. And instead of thinking, okay, we have a quantum system here, protect it from the surrounding environment, because then all the cool quantum effects will dissipate away, turn it 180 degrees around, and this is what the great physicist John Wheeler did. Let us just turn it all around and assume the entire universe is a quantum system. Mm -hmm. What comes out of the mathematics, so it's hard science. This is not new agey interpretation. This is a man of the same status as Richard Feynman, right? John Archibald Wheeler. He said, you know, when you look at the mathematics of it, they took the Schrodinger wave equation and applied it to the entire universe. If you take out what John Wheeler called the observer participant, you have a problem of frozen time. Mm. The universe does not evolve, it does not change, nothing happens. You have a perfect symmetry which is absolutely still, stagnant, mm. unmoving. You need to, and there's no time. It's frozen time, which means there is no universe happening. Introduce something out that into the equation and that is the observer participant and what the observer participant does is say now it is a conceptual designation it's an intrusion it's a intervention mm -hmm. into this smooth symmetry and by saying now now relative to now there's tomorrow there's yesterday there's future and past mm -hmm. and now you have a, a, a universe mm -hmm. that evolves no observer participant no universe and no time mm -hmm. right so what this what I've reflected upon this with tremendous enthusiasm for a number of years now, reading one paper after another. And what really comes out of this for me is that there is not a universe that we're all looking at as it's already out there and we're looking at it from multiple perspectives and trying to map it with the scientific world that represents what's already there. But rather there's one universe for every sentient being. Hmm. You're in the center of your universe but of course, this is not solipsism. It's absurd to think that, that, you know, that Stephen is any less real than me. That's just flat out silly, so I'm not going to go there. But Steve is in the center of his universe, and Fariba is in the center of her universe, and our universes are entangled. And so this is my dream from my perspective, and it's your dream from your perspective, and our dreams are entangled. And isn't that fascinating? Yes. <laughs> um.